What is the strangest mystery that is still unsolved? What on earth happened to the Trump family? So it's this Australian family who owned a berry farm. Somehow Mr. and Mrs. Trump and their three grown kids developed the belief that they weren't safe and they needed to flee their farm without cell phones or anything traceable, credit cards, etc. It sounds like the oldest son wasn't sold on whatever it was that led them to flee. He brought his phone, but eventually it got tossed from the car. He ended up bailing first and taking a train home. From there the rest of the family slowly separated and suffered various degrees of emotional breaks. The two girls stole a car. Somehow they got separated and one made it home, but the other was found on the floor in the backseat of some guy's car in a catatonic state. He spotted her after he started down the road. Eventually the parents were found wandering around aimlessly. Fortunately they were all okay physically but WTF happened? Was someone actually after them? Were they delusional? As far as I know the family hasn't released any updates. Asher Degree. Girl leaves her house in the middle of the night during a storm and disappeared. The only problem is that she was terrified of thunder and lightning and had no motive for leaving because her home life was fine. Then her clothes and backpack were found a year later in an abandoned construction site. There are a few that bug me. The Soda children, their house burned down in the middle of the night. Several of the kids were presumed dead, but their bodies were never found in the debris and it never burned hot enough to cremate them. It started to look extremely suspicious and the parents until their deaths believed that they had been taken for some reason. Many years down the line they did receive a photo and cryptic note from someone claiming to be their son but it was never authenticated. The boy in the box. A deceased little boy, found beaten, recently shaved of his hair and abandoned in the box for a bassinet that he was way too old for. The photos and reconstructions of him released to the public in the desperate hope of identifying him are haunting. The St. Louis Jane Doe, a little girl found in an abandoned house, decapitated and bound at the hands. They have no dental records or facial reconstruction to go from. The case has led nowhere, she's just nameless, lost to time. Tri-State Crematory. A devastating case of a man called back from his college football career to take over his father's business when the father fell ill. Over time people started noticing. Bodies. And body parts. On the grounds. Just hanging around. When someone finally took the reports seriously they found that he'd been piling bodies up randomly all over the property, often when it would have been much easier to cremate them instead of hauling them around to where they were dumped. The guy gave families canisters of cement dust instead of ashes. The mystery on this one is. Why? The guy never gave up the answer to what happened there and will only insist that there are no answers. His lawyer theorized he had mercury poisoning from cremating amalgam fillings, but that doesn't really explain why you would dump a body instead of cremating it when the latter takes less effort. The West Memphis 3 case. All of the satanic panic mess obscured so much that will probably go unanswered now. A bloody man covered in mud stumbled into a Bojangles the night those little boys went missing. Cops barely investigated that incident and lost the blood evidence they did collect regarding it. What was going on with John Mark Byers and Terry Hobbs, two dads of two of those kids, both turning up with evidence and acting at different points like they may have been involved? Where the ever-loving crap are all the severed human feet coming from? Lars Mittank. A German tourist on vacation in Bulgaria, he got into a fight and the medical complications kept him from going home on a flight with his friends. Staying behind, it looks like his mental state unraveled completely over the course of a few days, increasing paranoia eventually culminating in his complete disappearance into a field of sunflowers. The Overtown Bridge. It's a bridge in Scotland where dogs always unexplainably jump off. It's very strange and nobody knows for certain why they do this. Dogs who survived reportedly walked back up and jumped off again. They even had to put up a warning sign to keep your dog on a leash and to watch them. A lot of theories say maybe it's because of certain scents or animals down below, but most people have disagreed with this theory. It's fucking weird. 
Edit, in reality, I've done more research thanks to some comments, and it seems like people have romanticized this to make it creepier than it actually is. I don't know exactly what to believe since there's so much misinformation out there, but I'll just believe the articles who've done the most research for now. They say it was most likely not hundreds of dogs, because they can't find reports of that many jumping off like the legend says. It was only around six. So it's likely that I was misinformed like so many other people were and it's not actually a huge phenomenon lol. But it's still sad and a bit weird that six dogs jumped off. The Tamam Shoe case, also known as the mystery of the Summerton Man, is an unsolved case of an unidentified man found dead at 6.30 am, the 1st of December 1948, on the Summerton Park Beach, just south of Adelaide, South Australia. The case is named after the Persian phrase to Mamshud, meaning ended or finished, which was printed on a scrap of paper found months later in the fob pocket of the man's trousers. The scrap had been torn from the final page of a copy of Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, authored by 12th century poet Omar Khayyam. Tamam was misspelt as Taman in many early reports, and this error has often been repeated, leading to confusion about the name in the media. The Salish Sea Feet or the Mad Axeman of New Orleans. The Salish Sea Feet are the approximately 20 dismembered feet found in or around British Columbia or Washington, USA. The feet sometimes are found still inside of shoes. No one knows how they got there or where they came from. Over the course of the last 13 years, the authorities have ruled out foul play. The Mad Axe Man of New Orleans ran rampant in 1918 and 1919. He murdered six people, usually those of Italian descent, with axes or straight razors. In March of 1919, he sent a lengthy letter from Hottest Hell that was pretty nonsensical. But the most relevant paragraphs read. Now, to be exact, at 12.15, earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well, then, so much the better for you people. One thing is certain and that is that some of your people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. There were no murders that night because every dance hall in NOLA was filled to capacity. Three lighthouse workers with impeccable moustaches traveled to a remote island on December 7, 1900 for a lighthouse shift that should have lasted for two weeks. When a boat arrived to pick them up, they were gone. No trace of the bodies, and the lighthouse was strangely locked. Not only was the setting normal, meal ready to be served, but there was no fire in the fireplace, and the clock stopped. One of the men kept a log in a diary, and he said that the seas were rough one day, but when monitored, it was actually calm. No one knows what happened to them. Source. Source 2 skip to 443. Edit, the moustaches have nothing to do with the story at all. I just really liked them. The identity of and what happened to D.B. Cooper. A man on a plane called himself D.B. Cooper and claimed to have a bomb in use suitcase. He took the flight crew hostage and when he got the money he asked for he had the flight crew start flying again. Eventually he jumped out of the plane with a couple of parachutes and the money. No one knows where he went or if he even survived. The Konkalar Pass in Ladakh this region lies in the disputed border of India and China, and is truly the most inaccessible places in the world. In 1962, the armies of both the countries were engaged in a severe conflict. After this, both China and India entered into an agreement according to which none will be allowed to patrol the region, but can keep an eye on it from a distance. After this, a popular belief floated that the Konkalar Pass in Ladakh is a hideous base of UFOs. The area has forever remained a no-man's land due to its territorial limits and is the reason why the UFOs have chosen it as their operational base. 
Reportedly, many have seen these UFOs and both the Indian and Chinese governments are aware of these developments. In 2006, Google Maps too baffled the world with some images that looked like military facilities, but till date the whole issue remains mysterious and unexplainable. Literally any dig site in archaeology. Even the ones that are just garbage and pots herds are fascinating if you try to really picture the people behind them, what they thought and felt. Actually, garbage probably tells you more about a people than anything else, really. Slash archaeology major. But my favorite is Chauvet Cave. If you have a chance, watch Werner Herzog's documentary Cave of Forgotten Dreams. I think it's still on Netflix, it has some of the most stunning cave art in the world, which almost certainly had some kind of profound significance, and we don't, and will likely never, know what it is. Moreover, there's evidence that the cave was abandoned for thousands of years and later returned to, only for the returnees to continue to make paintings in the exact same style and, possibly, for the exact same reasons. There is so much to be seen in these figures. There's a portrait of an animal tossing its head that looks like one of the world's earliest explorations of stop motion or sequential art. When I look at it I can feel the will of the painter, who wanted so much to convey this sort of motion. There are also the footprints of a boy, who arrived much later to the cave than its original users, whose marks appear to be contemporary with the paw prints of a wolf. It's hard to say now, according to Cave of Forgotten Dreams, whether they walked together, whether they walked 20 years apart, whether they were friends or whether the wolf was stalking the boy. But I read a blog post by a professional hunter and tracker, who looked at the footage of the prints from the film and said that they likely walked together. I wonder what they were thinking. If the boy had some knowledge of what he would find there, or if he was simply exploring a cave and found some of the greatest art in the human history. In Chauvet there is also the solution to a mystery. Until the discovery of Chauvet cave paleontologists were unsure as to where the cave lions had manes. On the cave walls there is an illustration of a cave lion with visible testicles and no mane, settling that debate. If you would like to visit the cave, there is a 3D tour available here. Flight 19 of December 5, 1945. Five bomber craft on a routine training run became lost while heading back and eventually disappeared entirely. Audio has them saying that they thought they had ended up over the Florida Keys, but wind could not have allowed that. Even more interesting is the fact the rescue craft dispatched to locate them also disappeared. The Circleville Letters. In 1976, Residents of the small city south of Columbus, Ohio began receiving handwritten sinister and graphic letters. Each letter included secret and dark details about their personal lives. One resident received a ton of letters, accusing her of various unsavory acts. The author warned the resident that he had been keeping an eye on her home, as well as her comings and goings. The resident was horrified and tried to keep the letters a secret until her husband began receiving them. The attacks on the family continued, with large posters appearing around town spreading rumors about their 12-year-old child. One day in 1977, the husband left the house after receiving a call from who he thought was writing the letters. A few minutes later, the husband was found dead at the end of the street dead behind the wheel. The sheriff had ruled it a homicide when he realized that a single shot had been fired before the accident, but there was no evidence that the husband was shot at the site. The sheriff found the husband was twice the legal limit and ruled it a drunk driving accident. The letters began once again, this time accusing the sheriff of covering up the true nature of the death. The letters also accused the sheriff of mishandling an investigation into the county coroner who had been accused of other grotesque acts. The harassment continued, this time with signs along the road and in 1983, the original resident who had been accused of having an affair pulled over to remove a sign. During the effort to remove the sign, she discovered a box was attached and inside of it was a small pistol. The gun was part of a booby trap designed to fire when the sign was removed. Paul Fressauer was arrested and given 25 years, but one small problem. The letter writing continued even after Fressauer was put in jail. 
In a new batch of letters, the author had promised to dig up the grave of a deceased baby and mail the bones to the police in the case of another potential affair turned murder. Hundreds of residents continued to receive personal letters until 1994 when everything stopped. The toxic death of Gloria Ramirez. 23 people became ill due to her mere presence and 5 were hospitalized. We have never worked out what happened. There's an episode of the Stuff You Should Know podcast that talks about it. About 8.15 p.m. on the evening of February 19, 1994, Ramirez, suffering from severe heart palpitations, was brought into the emergency department of Riverside General Hospital by paramedics. She was extremely confused and was suffering from tachycardia and chain stokes respiration. The medical staff injected her with diazepam, midazolam, and lorazepam to sedate her. When it became clear that Ramirez was responding poorly to treatment, the staff tried to defibrillate her heart, at that point several people saw an oily sheen covering Ramirez's body, and some noticed a fruity, garlic-like odor that they thought was coming from her mouth. A registered nurse named Susan Kane attempted to draw blood from Ramirez's arm and noticed an ammonia-like smell coming from the tube. She passed the syringe to Julie Gorkinski, a medical resident, who noticed manila-colored particles floating in the blood. At this point, Kane fainted and was removed from the room. Shortly thereafter, Gorkinski began to feel nauseated. Complaining that she was lightheaded, she left the trauma room and sat at a nurse's desk. A staff member asked her if she was okay, but before she could respond she also fainted. Maureen Welch, a respiratory therapist who was assisting in the trauma room was the third to pass out. The staff was then ordered to evacuate all emergency department patients to the parking lot outside the hospital. Overall, 23 people became ill and 5 were hospitalized. A skeleton crew stayed behind to stabilize Ramirez. At 8.50 p.m., after 45 minutes of CPR and defibrillation, Ramirez was pronounced dead from kidney failure related to her cancer. A strange but not creepy mystery, the disappearance and reappearance of Lawrence Joseph Bader, he was a cookware salesman from Akron, Ohio who went missing in 1957. He went fishing, a storm hit, and his boat was found the next day with some damage. He was in debt and in trouble with the IRS and his wife was about to have their third child. Four days later, John Fritz Johnson appeared in a bar in Omaha, Nebraska, spoiler, it's Larry Bader. Fritz was known for his wild personality, he attracted local attention for sitting atop a flagpole for 30 days to raise money for polio, he became a radio announcer and a TV sports director. He drove around in a hearse with a bar and became a minor celebrity in Omaha. By no means was avoiding attention. In 1964, a cancerous tumor was found behind his left eye and it had to be removed. In 1965, Fritz was in Chicago for a tournament and an acquaintance from Akron recognized him, despite the eye patch, and confronted him, and then brought Bader's niece to take a look. She agreed it was her uncle and confronted him about it as well. Fritz denied it but found it humorous. Fritz's fingerprints were then matched to Larry Bader's military records and it was confirmed. Fritz Johnson always maintained he had no memory of his former life as Larry Bader. Psychiatrists examined him and believed he was telling the truth even though he had financial reasons to assume a new identity and the concept of someone forgetting their past and entirely constructing a different one with false memories is hard to fathom. It is also considered a possibility that the eye tumor had something to do with it. He ultimately died in 1966 from the eye tumor and it was never determined conclusively whether he was lying or not. I am fascinated by this case especially because he had an entire change in personality, an entire life backstory as Fritz, and he made no effort to live a low profile to avoid discovery. I found this case while looking through the Wikipedia category of people who have faked their own deaths, though it's debatable if this guy should even be on there, all of which are great stories. The Oakville Blob in 1994, there was a rainstorm in Oakville, Washington only the raindrops were a strange clear substance that had the consistency of jello. 
Lots of people experienced flu-like symptoms after coming into contact with it, and people's dogs and cats all over the city were dying. When a local hospital ran a lab test on the substance after one of the patients suggested it, it was found that whatever this mysterious rain was, it had human white blood cells in it. Some time after that, a sample was also sent to the Washington State Health Laboratory, where it was being researched by epidemiologist Mike McDowell. After he determined that it was man-made and speculated that it was some sort of matrix for transporting viruses slash bacteria, the samples suddenly went missing from the containment facility and his supervisor told him not to ask any questions. There are no known samples of the stuff anywhere today, despite being sent to several different facilities by various Oakville residents. So yeah, I'd personally say that this was clearly some sort of bioweapon test run, but by whom? I'd like to give the US government the benefit of the doubt here and assume it wasn't us testing something like that on our own citizens, but if it wasn't, why would it have been covered up like that? And you'd think an event like this would be a lot less obscure. Also, even if it being a bioweapon seems super obvious, how the heck did whoever dispersed it manage to make it rain over an entire city for several days? Sorrowful happiness that I just can't seem to guide.